thinking about the the language in my home state anytime someone tries to if not even have a reckoning just get at the truth they're always the people who say why are you opening these old wounds from the university of tulsa and public radio tulsa this is switchyard a podcast for people hungry for eye-opening essays, moving fiction, soul-stirring poetry, and honest, thought-provoking conversation. I'm Ted Genoways, editor of Switchyard Magazine, and your host. Join me and our lineup of literary all-stars as we think through and hash out our world's difficult and fascinating challenges. In this episode, I speak with Natasha Trethaway the Pulitzer Prize-winning former Poet Laureate of the United States, about a stunning and deeply felt sequence of poems that she wrote for the inaugural issue of Switchyard magazine about the legacy of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. The attack on the Greenwood District of Tulsa by a white mob on May 31st and June 1st, 1921, is believed to be the most deadly incident of racial violence in American history, though the exact death toll may never be known. In 2020, as the centennial of the massacre approached, the city of Tulsa agreed to take a step toward unearthing the truth. Using the ledger of a funeral home, billing the county of Tulsa for 18 burials of black victims of the mob in the Oaklawn Cemetery, a team of archaeologists and forensic anthropologists set about excavating the unmarked graves of the Potter's Field in hopes of finding what came to be known as the original 18. I asked Natasha Trethaway to take on the monumental task of writing about these events because she has spent more than two decades writing poems that excavate America's hidden history of racism and its long shadow. She has written poems about the lives of the mixed-race prostitutes photographed by E.J. Belloc in the Red Light District of New Orleans in the early 1900s, about the lives of the 2nd Regiment of the Louisiana Native Guard stationed off the coast on Ship Island to guard Confederate prisoners, about the lives of people portrayed in Spanish colonial paintings depicting the complex taxonomy and hierarchy of mixed-race children produced by interracial unions. Through it all, Trethaway always returns to her own childhood in Mississippi, as the daughter of a black woman and a white man, whose marriage was still illegal in the state. And she has written with heart-rending clarity about the violence and loss that she's experienced firsthand, including the murder of her mother, as chronicled in Trethaway's New York Times best-selling memoir, Memorial Drive. So when I told Trethaway there was a literal excavation underway in Tulsa, a massive undertaking aimed at locating the graves of people killed during the race massacre in 1921, her first question was whether she could visit the cemetery and meet Phoebe Stubblefield, the forensic anthropologist leading the unearthing an analysis of human remains. The cemetery was closed to the public, but we were able to watch the team's work through the wrought iron fence and then meet Dr. Stubblefield at the gate when her day's work was complete. We parted my disheveled appearance, but I was in soil. Hi, I'm hey. Stubblefield. Natasha Trethaway, pleasure to meet Pleased you. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Welcome to Oakland Cemetery. I've always been drawn to documentary evidence, even though I'm a poet. I try to make use of evidence, of science, of the records. They tell stories and then obscure stories Mm. as well. Yes. I always feel like if I can just show the evidence, then that's all that it will take to do the other thing I'm concerned with, which, of course, is social justice. But poets don't have to be aiming for social justice when they sit down to write. A scientist doesn't have to be aiming for justice, but it could possibly be the outcome. Well, I do wonder what will be the outcome of all of this, the investigation. 
for the decedents or next of kin, for me, mm-hmm. you know, it may be too early to note, but when I look at my 20 years ago, mm-hmm. I was finishing up my PhD and the Race Riot Commission happened. And mm-hmm. so I write a fairly straightforward document about here's what we'll do if we get to the remains. Mm-hmm. Well, then that investigation ended. And I didn't think anything would happen. And then 20 years later, here we are. And so I'm actually looking at remains to search for these victims. Now that I've seen the level of preservation, Mm -hmm. I'm very thankful we have DNA. So it's just as well that 20 years went by, actually. Oh, okay. Because we could have documented, and probably still will here, that there are gunshot wounds. If the bullets hit bone, they'll leave lead scatter. The men that we're looking for right now, the documented ones, they weren't medicalized. You know, there was no treatment. Mm -hmm. So they were just packaged for burial, not even with embalming. Mm -hmm. So we'll get bullets probably, lead scatter certainly. But information to ID people, Mm -hmm. much harder. So there's one decedent. He has a death certificate. His name is Curly Nevester Walker. Mm -hmm. And he has a World War I registration card. Mm -hmm. It has description, height information. And I look at that and I go... Unless you're of strange height, we won't be able to ID you just from that. Mm -hmm. But that's the information we have. Right. Clyde Snow collected the death certificates for the known decedents. And a lot of the information, like address information, occupation, are they married? He was indicating that for the white decedents, they were almost always better documented, maybe always, than the black decedents. After her trip to Tulsa, Trethaway spent months reading and writing. In the end, she produced a breathtaking kaleidoscopic sequence about all she had seen and felt. Those poems are available unabridged as a Switchyard podcast exclusive, and I encourage you to listen to them in their entirety. But here's one passage. The first day I spent in Tulsa, I woke that morning to a parade gathering outside my window, a commemoration begun in 1918 as Armistice Day, marking the end of the Great War. At Elgin and Archer, I was just blocks from the place I'd come to see, the heart of it, Black Wall Street, yet another sight steeped in the residue of history, of white mob violence settled down in the soil. I met with Trethaway just north of Chicago in Evanston, Illinois, where she teaches at Northwestern University, to ask her about the process of writing these poems, and also to discuss the raging controversy surrounding the inscribing and erasing of Black history. In May 2021, Oklahoma's House Bill 1775, signed into law by Governor Kevin Stitt, enacted new restrictions on what could be taught in the state's classrooms, specifically denying the existence of systemic racism and forbidding the use of any text or curriculum that would suggest that any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of their race or sex, or that such an individual, by virtue of their race or sex, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past. Last summer, the public schools in Tulsa were sanctioned by the state for requiring sensitivity training around the teaching of the events of 1921, upholding a complaint that the programs specifically shame white people. Let's start with talking about this poem, and we can start from the title. It's called Mm -hmm. Ground Truth. Explain for listeners, what is ground truth? This is something that I heard Phoebe Stubblefield say when I visited Tulsa back in November of 2022. And as I understand it, it's just, you know, what you can find on the ground by looking at the evidence and sifting through the facts that are there to be found if you're looking for them. And in her case, she's a forensic anthropologist who's excavating the potter's field, the unmarked graves in a corner of Oaklawn where it's believed that some of the victims of the 1921 race massacre were buried, but no one is certain. Mm -hmm. No one knows what's in those graves for sure. And so 
they're excavating and looking for clues. Right. And that's the thing that I love about the phrase because it is both literal and figurative, that she is literally looking for that ground truth. But even as I heard her say it, I understood it also as a kind of figurative thing that could work for bringing together a poem, which is why this poem is in two parts. I sort of saw not only the ground truth of the facts, but also the ground truth that the inner dispersal loop suggests, you know, the way that we can find out the truth of our American past and our attitudes about history based on the kinds of things we erect, the monuments, which I liken that highway to. Yeah. And I should explain this poem, it not only bravely takes on this whole sweep of American history and particularly looking at the country's racial history, but, I mean, you took on these huge issues as something that I asked you to do specifically for this issue. And for whatever reason, you said yes. For whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> it so, was a good assignment. Yes. No, there was a reason. Because it was interesting. It was interesting because of the specifics of Greenwood and Tulsa. But also, for me, it was interesting as something that... I have been concerned with across, I think, my entire career as a poet, things that have to do with historical memory and erasure and, you know, our American original sin of white supremacy and the way that it is manifest in so many places. And tell me, there's the second part of the poem. There's a kind of litany where many notorious racial incidents, lynchings, are listed I wonder at what point you became aware of those historical events in your own education. Were these incidents talked about? Were they things that you were taught or things that you found out later? All of them were things that I found out later. You know, occasionally there would be within a community or a family narrative something that had happened that was not inscribed in whatever textbooks or on the landscape in the form of monuments or memorials. And so I began to see that there were these things that I would find out through family or community that were not somehow part of the narrative of American history and our collective memory. And that's when I became really concerned with why these things were being erased or covered over as part of our cultural amnesia. Right. So tell me, why take on these kinds of subjects as poems, not as history mm -hmm. per se, not writing a nonfiction book, but instead in the form of poetry? Mm -hmm. You know, I think I love the envelope of form that a poem offers, that kind of density and compression that is often underscored by its rhythm, its cadence. I think the first thing that I fell in love with and memorized was the Gettysburg Address. And it is short, and it is moving. It is the density and compression, but also there's a cadence to it. And I wanted to memorize it so that I could recite those sonic patterns over and over again as I was walking around my neighborhood. And I think that was sort of an early influence for me to try to take these things that are unwieldy and huge and find the kind of form, dense and compressed and musical, that could bear the weight of it. And throughout your career, you've written in a number of established traditional forms in formal verse, which, of course, as you say, both gives it shape, it gives it some container, mm -hmm. but it also automatically puts you in dialogue with a tradition. Mm -hmm. And a tradition that, for the most part, has not been shaped by people who are like you. Mm -hmm. And so it puts you into dialogue with a power structure. Mm -hmm. I think about, you know, Audre Lorde, her words that the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. And, of course, we know that she was talking about the tools of oppression. But... I like to 
reimagine that to talk about the tools of received forms. These are monumental forms. Because they're monuments already, the challenge for me is to take those monumental forms and use them in the service of other monument making. It's a way of both pushing back against received knowledge, but also showing the way that these forms can do the work of dismantling the master's house. And the first part of this poem is a sonnet. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that decision, choosing to have a kind of introduction, an invitation to the reader in that form. Mm -hmm. This was the first part I wrote, actually, for the poem. There's the other reason I turn to traditional forms, when something seems unwieldy and big. I often turn to a traditional form to get a hold on it. And I think in my original thinking about this, I imagined that the most I could do was to take these almost bite-sized pieces of it. That if I could have a sequence of poems in these crystalline little sonnets of 14 lines, that I could manage it, that I could get through it, and that I could build momentum even with the white spaces that would happen between those poems. That turned out not to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the end of this one, and I was surprised that where I began was in the present moment. I began with this road that cuts Greenwood right through the heart, that goes over it, and allowed that to be the thing that took me into the past, how we got to be there. And I think it was, for me too, those two moments of devastation and destruction, which is pattern in American history. If we don't destroy it the first time, as in the massacre, we can destroy it a second time with putting a road through it and dividing a community. That's the story of the community that I come from in Gulfport, Mississippi, countless communities around the country. And so when you come to the second section, you have to have had some sort of a realization. You said that your thought was of a sequence of sonnets, and at a certain point, what comes forth is not another 14 lines, but a kind of outpouring. I don't even know how many lines it is, but it's yes. 120. Yes, it's an outpouring. The lines are longer. If I could have put the notes I was writing up on a chalkboard, I might, I might look a little crazy <laughs> because they were just, I mean, even the notes on the page, they were just all over the place. And for the longest time, I couldn't keep it all straight. It just seemed like too much. And what kept getting revealed were the patterns, how it was connected. A lot of it always seems like serendipity. You know, it's serendipitous that in Tulsa, they call that road interdispersal loop. Because I think that that's not a thing that they call it everywhere, but that's the name in Tulsa for it. The coincidence of the misspelling on a photograph where the photographer left out an N and instead of running the Negro out of Tulsa, you get ruining. The coincidence that I just happened to be able to make this trip without thinking about it on Veterans Day. I realized that all these things were part of something that was trying to come together that couldn't simply be taken in these neat little pieces. This goes back to your earlier question about when I knew about some of these lynchings or some of these events. I started visiting some of these places once I found out about them, because they are everywhere. I'd gone to the place that I first described, the lynching that happened in Duluth, Minnesota, and it just felt like I could chart my own path around this country with a constellation of places where these kinds of things had happened. So I wanted to see that on a map and see what it would be like if I tried to pull all those threads together and what pattern would be revealed if I could do that. And what do you think you saw? Hmm. Both how pervasive and invisible 
the pattern is, how some of us see it all the time, and we try to convince other people that it's there, and they won't see it. Some do. Some continue to not see it because it serves them not to see it. And as you know, that was part of the reason I asked you to take this on in the first place. In Oklahoma, the public schools are under sanction in Tulsa from the state for sensitivity training around teaching racial history and teaching specifically the race massacre. And the specific allegation was that the way that this was being taught was intended to elicit white shame. And the language of the law that was passed makes that possible. It says that no student should be made to feel anguish or discomfort or shame. And it's kind of couched in this progressive language of wanting students to feel safe, wanting the students to feel that they are equal. But it also very specifically says that there shall be no teaching, that there is structural inequity, that there is historical inequity. So you end up in a culture of denial. So yes, there's one group of students that arrives with some knowledge from outside the classroom. And don't feel safe because of that knowledge. When other students are denying the ground truth, are unwilling to learn it, you know, children, they learn to think a certain way. And I think it happens pretty early on. And it happens not just to black children who are aware of racial attitudes all around them. It happens to white children, too. They learn from what they see. And just to think that them learning about something in the past is going to shame them. I'm sorry, I'm sort of trying to get my head around this, but... Being on the wrong or right side of history about believing in the goodness of human beings and human potential is a choice that we learn to make. If we can learn that some people have been disadvantaged by what has happened in the past, slavery, Jim Crow, we can learn how other people have been advantaged by it. And I think we could teach a kind of justice, a kind of redress in which everyone understands that each of us should really be offered an opportunity at equal rights. And it always bothers me that there's a whole segment of the population that seems to believe that any advancements for African Americans, for example, means something is being taken away from someone else. What am I taking away from you? Your right to treat me as a second-class citizen? You have to give that up? Is that so hard to give up? So take us back to the beginnings of your writing career. These have been subjects that have been central to your thinking for a very long time. Mm -hmm. As you were starting out and trying to figure out what the topics were that mattered to you enough that you were going to engage with them and put your thoughts on them to paper. Mm -hmm. How did you know that this was your subject? I think it began in that community that I come from in Gulfport, Mississippi. This African-American community that had been there since after the Civil War. And I understood something wonderful and nurturing about that place that I did not feel if I went outside the confines of that place. And particularly when I was very small with both of my parents. My father is my white parent. He could come into that community, play on my great uncle's baseball team, go to his nightclub, get a job working on the docks with a black crew because my grandmother helped him get a job, and be just immersed and accepted in it. But if we went outside of that with my black mother, she was not. She was still diminished in so many ways and how she was treated in public. And so I was a kid, a very small child, seeing this. 
an understanding from an early age that it was about racism, white supremacy, how differently my parents were being treated. Some of the earliest poems I tried to write that were unsuccessful had something to do with the idea of permanence. I didn't know to call it inscription or monument or erasure at that time, but I was very concerned about what would be inscribed on the landscape of our presence. And I think that that came to me sort of metaphorically because my grandmother, her house was a shotgun house that was up on cinder blocks and you could see right underneath it. Often her yard would flood with heavy rain. And I remember one day when I was probably five years old, running to the back door and opening it and looking outside and the water was up to the stoop. And it made me think, how easily it would be for us to be just washed away out into the Gulf. But I could see that there were other things that had a kind of purchase on the American landscape because there's a monument to some Confederate soldier at the courthouse we go to or on the town square. These things had a lasting imprint. Even the little street sign that had Thomas Jefferson's name on it was like a little white concrete obelisk. And nothing like that was there for us. And I wanted to begin to inscribe us because I thought that we would be erased. Had already been. We're constantly being erased. And I wanted to do that at the same time as pushing back against these ideas of white supremacy, these deeply ingrained notions of racial difference and hierarchy that I saw everywhere around me. I've talked often about this set of encyclopedias that my family bought to commemorate my birth. And I love this idea because the acquisition of knowledge is the thing to commemorate a child's birth. It was a path that I was going to be set on. And I started looking at the pictures long before I could read the words. There was a section on races of man in there. And these sort of phenotypical-looking representations. And any way you looked at it, whether they did it in alphabetical order of nation or the letters of Caucasoid, Negroid, Mongoloid, however you looked at it, there was always a hierarchy. I could see that, even if I couldn't put a word to it yet. I think that's where it comes from. And the writing, I wonder, does it provide for you, in your mind, a place of safety from these things? Or is it a place that you enter with a certain amount of emotional risk and a recognition that to speak on these subjects means that in some ways you have to kind of pick at that scab? Mm. Safety is such a loaded word to me. I have a poem in which I ask toward the end, what does it mean to be safe in the world? I suppose if there is a safety in a poem, it's because it's the world I'm creating, a world in which all the things that are so wrong about this one still exist, But the poem suggests the possibility that they need not always exist. The poem suggests that I have the language, the voice, the ability to push back against those things. I'm not powerless because I have words. I think that's as safe as I can get. I wonder, can we get to that place of respect where we allow other people who have different ideas and different beliefs than we have to be part of our community. Can we get there without the discomfort, without even the anguish? I wonder. Absolutely not. I mean, it's required that we feel that. We have to deal with uncomfortable 
difficult truths. They don't have to destroy us. I'm sorry I get so quiet about it. It just... I'm tired. (laughs) I'm tired of seeing it getting worse, not better. One of the things that I wrote about in the introduction to this issue of Switchyard is one of the survivors of the race massacre you may have come across, George Monroe, who was a five-year-old kid Mm -hmm. when the massacre occurred. His house was burned, and he described coming out of his house with his siblings being rushed into the street by his mother and looking around, and everything was burning. And he turned to his older sister and said, is the world on fire? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his world was. And as we think about children and school children and what they learn and how we can protect them or make them feel safe, that those laws never seem to be really thinking about making all children equally safe. And not recognizing that for some kids, the world is still on fire. The world is still on fire. As a person who has always seemed to know about trauma and loss, and I mean not simply familial or personal traumas and losses, but national ones, the way that white supremacy is a trauma. It is so disfiguring, and even more disfiguring, I think, for the white people who practice it, or not even practice it, but have it so deeply ingrained as to be synonymous with a kind of truth. It's a disfiguring thing. It is a kind of disease. But there are cures. Education that leads to empathy, to imagining oneself in the position of others, is a way to cure that. Because we only want to believe in American exceptionalism, American goodness, as opposed to understanding that if there is something potentially great about this nation, it is the willingness to confront the truth of our history and to continue to strive toward living up to our highest ideals. And people, so many people seem to think it's a zero-sum game, that injustice for all doesn't really mean injustice for all because it means if you give justice to these people, then somehow I'm losing something. It's not a zero-sum game. Well, and as you say, really it's about just having a place that is secure enough that there's purchase that there's some feeling that there can be permanence and that there can be just something that you can count on. And as you say at the end of the poem, it's just a toehold. Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just enough to feel like there's possibility. There's possibility, right? We just need just enough of a toehold and a willingness to examine the ground truth that it brings to us. Natasha, thank you so much for having this conversation. I can't thank you enough for writing your essay, introducing these poems and the poems themselves. They are truly remarkable. And I am so pleased and so honored to have them in the first issue of Switchyard and to have you here on the podcast. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ted. I wouldn't have done it without you asking me and giving me that assignment. It was a hard one but I loved it. Thanks for listening to Switchyard. I'm your host, Ted Genoways. If you liked this episode and you want to support our podcast, please share it with your friends, post about it on social media, and leave a rating and review.
Switchyard is a production of the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa. We made this episode with executive producer Marianne Andre, Charles Lipper and Cass Ali at Volubility Podcasting, and Scott Steinman at Studio Media Recording Company. Special thanks to TU President Brad Carson and the Church Studio.